Good evening, and welcome to another ghoulish, monstrous, and shame-slash-blood-soaked episode of Wahapa, the show where we dissect some of the saddest, most disappointing video game disasters of all time. So then let's get right to it, shall we? Today's terrible topic is unfortunately something that strikes a particularly sensitive chord in my soul because it was a game that I was personally looking forward to, had a legacy to stack up against, and was being worked on by a crew of passionate creatives that simply found themselves in an unenviable situation. Today, we are discussing 2010's Splatterhouse remake. You're gonna have to learn to love the pain. There's a lot more of it to come. The House of Splatter was built smack dab in the middle of the slasher renaissance of the 1980s, specifically 88. Just to put you in the mindset, what were other notable horror franchises doing at the time? While Freddy was trying to conquer the Dream Master, Kane Hodder slipped on the hockey mask to bathe in some new blood, and a little buddy named Chucky started to carve up cinemas nationwide. What were horror video games doing? Nothing, because they barely existed at the time. Outside of maybe some obscure home computer games, crappy Atari adaptations, and Castlevania, it wasn't exactly a booming genre. That all changed when Namco unleashed Splatterhouse onto the arcade scene, which, much like Castlevania was an homage to Universal Monsters, Splatterhouse was a send-up of American slasher slash horror films. It starred every man, Rick Taylor, who becomes possessed by the evil and vaguely sports-shaped terror mask and was tasked with saving his girlfriend Jennifer from the mad Dr. West. To do this, he'd have to survive the many gore-laden hallways of the West Mansion and fight as many movie references as possible, with the Evil Dead being one of the most obvious. The game was a hit, featuring then taboo levels of violence and mayhem, and received a lone Turbo Graphics port. If you want to see someone get super nerdy on some classic Splatterhouse, check out one Derek Alexander's video on the series in the description below. Two sequels were then released in the following years, both exclusive to the Genesis, with even a chippy-based spin-off inexplicably making its way to the NES of all things. That's like releasing a video game based on the Human Centipede on the DS, published by Sanrio. Now, like we mentioned, Splatterhouse the Third splattered onto the Genesis in 1993, making it the last entry in the series for 17 years. That is, until Namco resurrected the IP, gave it to Rise of the Kasai developers Bottle Rocket, then they fired Bottle Rocket, then they hired the Afro Samurai team to finish it, then formed a brand new team to help them, then released the game to critical and commercial failure, and hasn't breathed a word about the franchise ever since. What. Fucking. Happen. Oof. Now, I have to preface this a bit. If you followed Splatterhouse even casually from around 2008 to 2010, you would know it was looking grim even back then. Namco couldn't contain all the explosions exploding off screen from the general public, but it was only until earlier this year where Polygon took a deep dive into the hellish development of the game where a lot of new insight has been gleamed. I'll be referencing that article later on, but before that, let's just take a surface level look at the dark clouds that swirled around the West Mansion during that fateful time period. In 2007, Namco would contract Bottle Rocket, who were fresh off making Rise of the Kasai, the less warmly reviewed successor to the Mark of Cree, with the director's position falling onto the pointy shoulders of one Jay Beard. Development had started, but it wasn't until May of 2008 where the game was formally unveiled to the public. Namco gleefully went all in on the edgy, blood-soaked aesthetic, showing lots of great concept art and listing Primal and Gritty as a gameplay feature. This announcement also promised a 2009 release date. That is a thing that did not happen. In fact, the thing that did happen in 2009 were reports that Namco had unceremoniously yanked the development kits and all work done up until that point from Bottle Rocket and was shopping the project around elsewhere. 
to all of us, at the time, this would seem like a big mean move by a big mean publisher. But it was Namco trying its best, albeit not in the most elegant way to save the project. A month later, in March, Namco would go on record saying that the only reason a project gets taken away from a developer is due to performance issues and plainly stated that Bottle Rocket was not meeting their requirements. Main development duties would then pass on to the Afro Samurai team that was working within Namco itself. Following that, delays. More delays than you could shake a nail-filled 2x4 at. To any casual splatter freak, these were all ill omens for the reboot's chances of success, and Splatterhouse, even in its heyday, never really achieved the notoriety of its contemporaries like Castlevania, so it already had an uphill climb ahead of it. What's interesting is that a lot of projects that wander into this hazy, purgatory-like state of development almost never see the light of day, StarCraft Ghost being a great example. This new take on the franchise, however, just like Rick himself, would eventually crawl through a pool of its own blood to reach its goal. It wasn't until the end of 2010 where the game finally released on November 22nd, unfortunately missing the kind of important spooky month of October where Namco marketing reps felt the game would have had its best chance to sell the most copies which it did not sell. Splatterhouse already had a stinky stigma about it and the critics took that to heart. It got roasted in reviews and many fingers were pointed in many different directions. There's a whole shitload of seven years bad luck coming your way. Lots of people blame Namco for the last minute developer switch. The Afro Samurai team, whose last game was middling at best, also took a shellacking. And of course, Splatterhouse was the game that killed Bottle Rocket, which officially closed its doors well before the game came out as they were never able to secure a deal with any other publisher, we shall see why. That's the widely known version of the game's development cycle that most people would be familiar with. But remember that Polygon article we mentioned earlier? Yeah, it's about time for that. I implore you to read it in full, link in the description below, but a truncated version is definitely in order here. Namco's Makoto Awai was in charge of bringing back Splatterhouse and to make it into a big, juicy, bloody rare steak for gamers to consume, and more specifically, Western ones. The mandate was to make a heavy metal infused violent affair as that was the style at the time in the testosterone fueled age of the 360 and the PS3. You know, makes sense. The franchise was already known for pushing the envelope in the late 80s and early 90s, but it was also a risky time for game development as well. So Namco needed to find a competent but not overly expensive studio to bring Splatterhouse to life. Enter Bottle Rocket, who was chosen from the goodwill the team had garnered on its previous work with Sony. Namco's design parameters for the reboot were not complicated. A gritty art style, buckets of blood, and remaining true to the original games by making it a simple brawler that anyone could pick up and play. That, however, was not exactly what Bottle Rocket were making. Jay Beard was the intermediary between Namco and the other leads on the development team and promptly ignored all of their demands. In fact, Mr. Beard decided that the game needed more Rise of the Kasai and started to implement the targeting system from that game into Splatterhouse, despite Namco wanting none of it. Character design was also a point of contention, as instead of just simple ghouls and zombies, the art team had been directed to start exploring alternative ideas that maybe strayed too far from what Namco was expecting. Every time producers from the publisher would make a visit to Bottle Rocket, Mr. Beard would show them anything from the game lying around that would fit what they were expecting. When the suits would leave, he would then tell the team to continue on with the stuff he was expecting. However, when milestone builds would be sent to Namco, there would be no hiding what the game was turning into, and Namco would make their displeasure known. What complicated matters was that this was Bottle Rocket's first HD game, and while development was going okay on the 360 version in terms of performance, the PS3 was seriously lagging behind, mainly because of the engine that was chosen, which of course was Unreal 3- No! No! Oh, they could only be so lucky. 
for whatever reason, Gamebryo is what Splatterhouse ran on, and Bottle Rocket were not equipped to deal with the headaches that would present. Okay, you raggedy little fucker. Let's see what you're made of. Namco got increasingly nervous with the lack of progress in uh, pretty much every area of the game, and Mr. Beard was still ignoring a lot of their mandates. Remember when we said that matters were getting complicated? Let's complicate matters further. During all of this, Bottle Rocket took on another project for a completely different publisher. This time, infamous money laundering scheme Brash Entertainment, who has a long rap sheet of screwing over many a decent development house. They had Bottle Rocket working on an adaptation of DC's Flash, and were trying to make it into a huge open world action game thing, but like all other projects under its umbrella, everything came crashing down when the sleazy publisher suddenly declared bankruptcy. They could no longer pay the multiple developers it had under contract, and the Flash game was unceremoniously cancelled before the public even knew it existed. For more on this, check out Liam Robertson's video on the Flash game, which, again, you can find in the description below. So, without that safety net of two titles keeping them afloat, the pressure was on for Bottle Rocket to deliver with Splatterhouse, which, as we know, was going really well. With every new milestone build, Namco kept seeing a lot of its feedback and direction still not making it into the game they were paying for, and by early 2009, the decision was made to try and salvage... something. Jay Beard and Namco clearly weren't seeing eye to eye, and with their last remaining game no longer in studio, Bottle Rocket closed six months later. Namco, however, realized the talent that was on the development team and personally contacted several key members, Jay Beard oddly not being one of them, and offered the chance to finish building the Splatter House and even set up another office for them to do so. The new digs would be located in Carlsblad, California, and would be made up of about 20 ex-Bottle Rocket employees, who would split the work with the Afro Samurai team, who were located in Santa Clara, California. Most Californians might know this, but that's not across the street, as both cities are a good six hours away from each other. For another whole year, the long-distance relationship between both teams was maintained, but it was always under a constant strain. One of the main reasons why is that they almost had to start again from scratch. See, in all the time Mr. Beardo was in charge, Bottle Rocket never got the game to anywhere near complete. There were some unconnected maps created and you could make Rick move, but that was it. It was still missing a variety of features, effects, and just wasn't fun. That year of further development time was a constant state of crunch, as Namco could pull the plug if anything went wrong. But fortunately, through a lot of long hours and late night pizza, both teams were able to pull it off and got the game to a playable finished state in late October of 2010. Not surprising, the game wound up feeling unpolished. Lots of bugs and iffy controls plagued the platforming and side-scrolling sections. Additionally, the first few hours of the game were some of its roughest, as the team simply ran out of time to balance things further and to properly convey to the player how everything worked. Show him why we call it... Splatterhouse. This, as you can guess, makes for a bad first impression, but as the game goes on, you can clearly see a lot of love and passion poured into the surprisingly fleshed out story, as well as featuring lots of extras and has loads of imaginative level designs and some pretty fun boss battles. All in all, it's a miracle Splatterhouse wound up being as good as it is, all things considered. Unfortunately, even with all that work and crunch to try to save the whole thing, as we all know, the critical reception for the game was not good, and of course didn't equate into strong sales either. The Carlsblad studio was closed as well because it was always meant to be a temporary thing to finish the game and everyone went their separate ways. Jay Beard you say? He currently works as an art director at Amazon Games in San Diego, which is good because you should probably keep that guy out of a directing chair. 
As for Rick, Jennifer, and Dr. West, well, shockingly, after eight years, Namco Bandai opened up a mysterious website just a few months ago which featured a dark foreboding house dripping with atmosphere and untold horrors, which turned out just being DLC for some fucking Sword Art Online mobile game. Hey, if you have a nose for failure and want to throw those stinky video game turds up on our stage, suggest one in the comments below or send me a frank and cordial email to mattmuscles at gmail.com. Thanks for watching!